This episode is brought to you by La Quinta by Wyndham. Your work can take you all over the place, like Texas. You've never been, but it's going to be great because you're staying at La Quinta by Wyndham. Their free bright side breakfast will give you energy for the day ahead. And after, you can unwind using their free high-speed Wi-Fi. Tonight, La Quinta. Tomorrow, you shine. Book your stay today at LQ.com. It's almost Earth Day, and today on CityCast Boise, we're celebrating by revisiting a chat with Julie D'Agostino, the founder of Rolling Tomato, who is helping to cut greenhouse gases one meal at a time. Our executive producer, Frankie Barnhill, finds out more about this nonprofit's mission to make food waste obsolete. It's Monday, April 15th. I'm Lindsay Van Allen, and this is what Boise's talking about. Julie, thanks for coming on CityCast Boise. Oh, it's great to be here. Okay, so before we get into the details of your work with Rolling Tomato, um, can you give can you give us a sense of how much perfectly edible, absolutely fine food ends up in the landfill in Boise? Well, when I first started doing a little research in 2016 when I got here, uh, I was reading that it was about 17,000 tons of edible food was hitting the Ada County landfill. Now, 2016, we've had a lot of growth in the valley since then. Yeah. So we can assume it's it's more than that, probably. Um, that's a fair assumption. It, do you feel like the extent of this problem, you, you said you came, wh- where were you before when you when you moved here in 2016? Uh, I, I'm originally a New Englander, but I was living in the Bay Area. Do you feel like, since you have some kind of comparative uh, perspective, do you think that Boise's food l- waste problem is, you know, comparable to other places or, or are we doing it better or worse than others? Do you have any idea about that? You know, people have been doing food recovery on their own, but there really wasn't, from what I could tell, a source that you could go to and have it end to end transparent. And so that's what I why I started Rolling Tomato. I would hear stories about groups or individuals recovering food and bringing it somewhere, but the accountability really wasn't there. How long has it been in a car? Has the food been handled safely? And even just recording the the volume for the year, et cetera. So I would say that maybe the Treasure Valley was a little behind some of the other cities that I've seen, but I know that there was some effort before this for the type of food recovery that that we do. Gotcha. Okay. And I guess is the phrase food waste a misnomer? Like there's nothing wrong with the food that we're talking about here. Is it really waste? <laughs> how, do, how, do, how do you think about that? It's kind of funny. I, I usually say to people, it's only food waste if you're wasting it. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just food. Yeah. So I like to think of it as excess food or extra food in one organization, whether it's a corporate kitchen or if it's a, you know, um, employer cafeteria, hospital cafeteria, whatever it is, it's just excess food in the wrong place. It just needs to go somewhere else where it's going to get utilized. Yeah. It's like a distribution problem, I suppose. It really is. Yeah. So you mentioned a little bit, but w- what specifically got you interested in food recovery? Have you are always, is this always been a pet peeve of yours? Like <laughs> seeing food go to waste? It really has. I worked, uh, like so many people, in restaurants in high school and through college, uh, back of the house, in front of the house, and I saw a lot of food waste. I did see some companies that were managing their excess food pretty well, uh, but in general, there's so much going to waste. And, you know, as you're working as a high school kid in the back of the kitchen, you're not going to have a terribly <laughs> large impact on the organization. <laughs> sure. Um, But even when I was no longer in food service and I was on the other side of the catering tables or, you know, attending events or things like that, I'd wonder how much is in the back that hasn't been served. That's going to, you know, where's, where is it going to go? So it is something that's always bothered me. I had the opportunity to start volunteering for another organization out of state um, that had recently spun up. You know, I thought, oh, this will be good, something nice to do for my community. But then after I was doing it for a while, I realized the impact it was really having, both the environmental side of saving perfectly good food and the social service side of getting it to people and organizations that can use it quickly. So it had a lot more value than I had even realized until I was doing it myself. 
So you started Rolling Tomato in Boise, and you were the first and only volunteer at first. But since then, your organization has grown with more volunteers, which really seem like the backbone of the organization. So walk me through a typical day for you or one of your volunteers, where where they, they might go to do donation food pickups. Okay. Volunteers that we have are absolutely the lifeblood of our organization. Uh, We wouldn't be able to do the amount that we're picking up and delivering each week, each year without them. I have between 25 and 30 volunteers. Some are seasonal, you know, some are certain times, some are um, every week and some some are, you know, more occasional. But let's take a volunteer that has a weekly food run. And that means that they're going to go and pick up at one or more area commercial businesses. It could be Um, a Starbucks. We go to three or four different Starbucks uh, a few times a week, pick up their sandwiches and pastries and all that sort of thing. It could be going to the Boise Co-op North End to pick up excess produce that's left, which maybe isn't quite the primo that they want to have on the the, uh, shelves, but it's still perfectly good. Um, And so wherever a volunteer is picking up, generally it's a scheduled pickup and they know the staff. So, you know, that's great. And they put it in their car or vehicle and they they drive it to their usual drop-off place, which is almost all of them are local nonprofit organizations. Again, they know the people there, which is very helpful. You know, then they're done after it's delivered. Uh, We tend to operate like a business to business um, operation. So, we it's not every day that we see the direct end eaters, if you will, but we're really trying to work with local nonprofits to help the people that they serve. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, you mentioned some kind of like chain restaurants that you work with in, in the metro in Boise, but you also, as you mentioned, the co-op. Um, I understand St. Luke's is a big partner of yours where you get food from their kitchens that are that's excess. Acme Bake Shop, Good Time Bagels I saw on your Instagram, um, Bardenay. Uh, so a bunch of these these local um, uh, businesses that don't want to see food go to waste but need someone to come and, and distribute it to someone else who needs it. So what are can you go into a few of the, the organizations that make use of these donations? You said you don't get to actually see the eaters necessarily, but you do, the, your volunteers are dropping them off at, at various organizations. Right. Most of them are, you know, we're going to the cafeteria or the, the kitchen staff uh, doors uh, to, to hand over the, the food. Also, one I should mention too, which is a big one local, is Charlie's Produce. Mm. A lot of produce twice a week from them. Um, so a volunteer could go, let's say Charlie's produce pick up. We can have anywhere between two and four pallets of food where that we try to take a variety of food. And one of my volunteers might go to good Samaritan home, which is a permanent residential home on state street. I'll have other volunteers going out to some local food pantries, Boise. Um, we have Nampa, we have e- a couple in Eagle and some of them are church pantries, and they also really love it when we bring them fresh produce more so than other things. And that's really what we try to get is fresh food or freshly prepared food. Um, occasionally, someone will donate shelf stable, which is fine, but you know there are other avenues for that. And really, we saw the gap with fresh and freshly prepared foods that that weren't getting picked up. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm I'm imagine yeah, people would get excited when they see a bunch of uh, fresh lettuce or uh, some fruit that they can eat right away or pass out to folks right away, or fresh baked goods that uh, just didn't get used. I know that uh, schools are schools receiving some of this. Like, are, are Boise kids getting to take advantage of of some of this food? Yes, we're really happy that we partner with the Boise Community Schools, which are some of the higher need schools in and around Boise. And uh, we've been working with them for a few years. So we bring a combination of fresh food to them as well as some prepared food. And for the Boise Community Schools, they have resource centers right at the schools and also food pantries. So it's great. The kids could pick something up. Family members picking up the children could go in and, and get what they need. That's been a really nice partnership that we've had going for a few years. 
How is, um, I'm just curious, uh, how is the delivery done? You know, like produce, for example, uh, I imagine, are your volunteers just stocked with a uh, bunch of coolers in their car or how does, how does that stuff get transported and, um, you know, made sure that it's still fresh if that's the case? Most of the food runs that we do are a half an hour or less, to be honest with you. Hmm. So if we're taking something out of coolers, it's a pretty short trip to be, to get arrive at the food recipient. Sure. So less of a concern, really, to, to make sure. We're careful. We do a lot of food runs in the morning, especially in summertime when it's cooler. We use refrigerator blankets and things to keep the, the cool temperature. We only pick up things that are uh, cooled. We, we don't pick up hot foods. Um, and that's a, a big piece of this is that there are laws on the books uh, that protect both the food donors as well as sort of the organizations like myself who are transferring the food from place to place. And uh, a lot of folks initially don't realize that there's federal laws that protect everyone involved. So, you know, I've heard from sometimes small businesses say, well, we don't want to get sued. And I, I totally get that. But it's it's actually called the Bill Emerson uh, Good Samaritan Food Donation Act. And it does exactly that, protects hmm. food donors from liability when donating to a nonprofit organization. And the law was enacted to encourage organizations to donate healthy food. So I think it's worth mentioning. Yeah, good to know. Very good to know. This episode is brought to you by ShipStation. If you run an e-commerce business, you know how much work it takes to produce something great while dealing with complicated shipping issues. That's why over 130,000 companies have turned to ShipStation, an innovative tool that allows you to focus less on shipping and more on building your brand. With ShipStation, you can manage orders, label printing, reporting, and customer service on one easy-to-use dashboard. You'll reduce warehouse costs with reliable enterprise solutions and save thousands on shipping costs with discounts up to 89% off. Plus, you can effortlessly import orders from everywhere you sell online. So, turn your shipping challenges into opportunities for growth. Go to ShipStation.com and use code POD to sign up for your free 60-day trial. That's ShipStation.com, code POD. So how much food, give me give me some numbers or just a visual, how much food does your group recover every year? Sure. Well, keep in mind that we're almost entirely a volunteer organization. In 2022, we recovered about 62,000 pounds of perfectly good food and kept that out of landfill and, you know, prevented... Wow. Methane gas, which is the hot gas, right? Yeah. Fast gas, and then also CO2. Um, so that was pretty great that we did that. that I think that doubled to 2021. And this year, we've tripled that number. We collected 216, almost 217,000 pounds of food. Um, and it was the same number of volunteers, just a lot more shuffling. And, uh, That's incredible. <laughs> Yeah. And a big part of that was because we did partner in January with Charlie's Produce and they've been, um, we about half of our food pickups have been Charlie's Produce. So that's pretty awesome. And it's really a wonderful feeling, like you were saying before, to be able to give great produce, a variety, and even all year round has been really nice. Yeah. Wow. That's something that people aren't going to do if they're really watching their their funds. Sure. Yeah. We know that that stuff's most expensive um, at the grocery store. Yeah. If I, okay, let's say I, I own a pizza shop and I made a, made a bad pizza or I made a pizza with the wrong toppings, but it's going to be delicious for somebody. What, how does this work? Do you just, do they text you? Is there a app or something? Like how do you get it, that person get it in your hands, your a volunteer's hands to then distribute it as, as fast and efficiently as possible? Well, once they contact us, we try to find out, is this a, kind of a one-off? Something happened where they had a big event and they have all this extra food? Or is this something that's every week they, they could maybe be putting things aside and we could pick up on a regular basis? Of course, because we're, again, we're a volunteer group, it's helpful for us to have a little bit of notice before we go and pick up like one pizza. So sure. we try to have a minimum of say 20 pounds or so of, of food before we bring a volunteer out and, and you know spend the time to, to go recover it. Julie, why, I have to ask, why is your organization called Rolling Tomato? Where did this name come from? I wanted to name the organization something kind of fun and hopefully memorable. Rolling Tomato to me just sounded like it ex it explains the, the fresh food aspect, mm -hmm. but it isn't dire 
consequences. It's it's just <laughs> doing something good in the community. And I like the idea that it's it hopefully something kind of piques their people's interest and asks me about it, which actually they they usually do when they see my the company <laughs> name. Yeah, the the idea of rolling, it's moving, it's moving from one place to another, um, to somewhere else that needs it. Where do you see the organization headed over the next few years? Because I know that uh, Rolling Tomato has grown pretty rapidly in the last since you began it. Um, do you see that growth continuing? I really do. You know, we've just scratched the surface for both the need and the opportunity to collect more food and and to get it out to our community members who need it. We do need to grow. We've we've grown the amount of food that we recover, but now we're sort of working on our infrastructure a little bit. We're running a capital campaign because we need to collect more produce at one time and more fresh food. So we're working on getting a delivery vehicle. And uh, we'd really love to get a small space to park said vehicle and some freezers and fridges. Right now we work out of my home. Oh, wow. <laughs> so- <laughs> How many fridges and, and everything do you have at your house? We have two fridges and we're due to get a freezer soon. Okay. And it works for the short term because really we're picking up and dropping off point to point most times. There's just sometimes we get so much of one thing, it would be really helpful to hold it for even a few days a week and then slowly stagger it out into the various places that we deliver to. Do you need more volunteers right now? Or are you are you looking for more volunteers all the time kind of thing? Or do you kind of have, uh, you're at capacity at the moment? We always can use volunteers. It depends on what skills. You know, a lot of people like to come and just drive because it's, it's really nice on both ends. People are excited to see you, to give you extra food uh, because it's not going to go to waste. Their creations aren't going to end up in the landfill. The other side of it is people are really excited to see us bring in quality food in the door for the people that they serve. So there's that need, but there's also a need for specialty skills. We are looking for an accountant or CPA to volunteer with us would be really helpful. We could use someone with a legal background for those times that we need a little guidance on the right way to do something. So we're always looking for volunteers. And quite honestly, with the amount of increased food that we've collected, we do need more food runners too. So Boise has this very bold stretch goal of being carbon neutral in the whole community uh, by 2050. And um, I'm curious, you know, this, this, your, your small organization, you know, is one piece of that very large puzzle. And another piece of the puzzle is Boise's composting program. I'm curious what you think about that, because of course, that the goal there is to divert from the landfill to composting, which is a better use for uh, food waste when you're looking at, you know, clearing out greenhouse gases. What do you think about the composting program? I really like the composting program. I know that a lot of time and effort went in to pull it together. I hope to see that it expands a little bit more mm-hmm. and can accommodate more types of food. And also, I'm under the impression that it isn't available for everyone in Boise. I think there are some apartment buildings and other large dwellings that don't necessarily offer compost, which is kind of a shame. That is correct. I can attest as someone who's lived in a downtown uh, par- uh, apartment building and also in the North End, um, that, that that can be a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And really with the, the case of composting is wonderful for foods that have already gone by or skins or, you know, <laughs> what have you, the end bits and things like that of, of produce that you're cutting off. Right. But what I'm looking to collect really is food that should never go into the compost to begin with because Mm. it's still perfectly good. So to kind of make that just a way of doing business in Boise is what I hope, you know, how, where am I, what, how much, how much food excess are we going to have? Where is it going to go? How do we get it there? That sort of thing. Yeah. It needs to just become part of just the way businesses operate. Right. The way we do things. Julie, thanks so much for sharing the story of Rolling Tomato and, you know, good luck this year with the capital campaign and everything you're up to. Thank you very much. That's all for today here on CityCast Boise. If you enjoyed the show, you should subscribe to our Hey Boise newsletter to stay up to date with local events. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more Treasure Valley stories. See you then. See you then.